Welcome to the MacArthur Memorial Podcast. I'm your host, Amanda Williams. Join me as we explore the life and legacy of General of the Army Douglas MacArthur and discuss a wide range of military history topics from the American Civil War to the Korean War. Hi, welcome everyone. Um, my name is Amanda Williams, and I am here today with Jim Zobel, MacArthur Memorial Archivist. And from February 29th to May 18th, 1944, a thousand troopers of the 1st Cavalry Division, a few U.S. Navy destroyers, and a handful of fighting Seabees defied the odds and seized the Admiralty Islands, making it possible for MacArthur to keep his famous I shall return promise. The Admiralty Island campaign was the boldest action of General Douglas MacArthur's forces during World War II. And some contemporaries have called it a reckless action. Others have called it brilliant. And today, Jim and I are going to break it all down. So Jim, it's early 1944. Where are we in the Pacific War? And specifically, can you explain Operation Cartwheel up to January 1944? That's a whole uh, another podcast in itself <laughs> explaining that. Well, uh, Cartwheel is the third task of the three-task initiative that the JCS gives to Nimitz and MacArthur back in July of 1942. Uh, this was right after the establishment of the Southwest Pacific Area. The first task was Guadalcanal. The second task was that Bunagona campaign establishing themselves on the north coast of New Guinea. So Cartwheel uh, takes off from that, and it's going to use both MacArthur's forces and Halsey's forces. This is Admiral William F. Halsey acting in conjunction with each other, going against the main Japanese base at Rabaul, which is on New Britain Island. MacArthur will take off from that Bunagona area and drive north across the coast of New Guinea using the Australian troops, and he'll use American troops under 6th of uh, the Alamo forces called under Walter Kruger to go through the Trebian Islands and then to New Britain by December of 1943. Rabaul sits on New Britain, and at the same time, Halsey's driving through the Solomon Islands in New Georgia, Bougainville, taking on the Japanese Navy, as well as a large contingent of air power, like MacArthur's forces are from New Guinea side. Uh, Australians will move into Le Salamawa in uh, September of 1943, and then in October of 1943, they'll go into Finchhaven. They'll get into a real bad fight there. Um, in the Saddleberg Mountains, but then in December when uh, they go into New Britain, MacArthur is able to seize that Huon Peninsula and the Vitiaus Straits. This is about 300 miles north of uh, Bunagona, where he starts from. And so come in that January time frame, uh, they are then looking to go uh, on the north coast of that Huon Peninsula, south of New Britain Island, and hit a place called Sidor. They're going to throw the 32nd uh, Regimental Combat Team in there, and this is gearing up for the end of the cartwheel operation. But in January, this is the next position that they're looking at is Sidor. And then beyond that, Medang, Hansa Bay, Weewak, whereas Halsey's going to be moving up, uh, circling Rabaul from the north and from the east. And they're going to throw the New Zealand troops into Green Island. And MacArthur's going to want Halsey to be uh, thinking about going into Kaviang in New Ireland. And this is to all isolate Rabaul. See, they were thinking about going at it directly. But in August of 43, at this Octoban conference, the combined chiefs of staff uh, decided they were going to do their best just to bypass Rabaul. And this is where you get into that first bypassing kind of mentality strategy or strategy that's going to last for MacArthur uh, through the way arrest across New Guinea. So according to Cartwheel, Hansa Bay was the next target. So how and why then do the Admiralty Islands become the main focus? Well, it's all because of that Sidor operation. When Clarence Martin's 32nd Regimental Combat Team is thrown in there, see the Australians after Finchhaven are chasing the Japanese west across New Guinea. And the Japanese uh, 18th Army is there established at Madang. And that's under this guy, Lieutenant General Hatazo Adachi. 
Now, Rabaul runs everything, the 8th Area Army, which controls the 18th Army. They're at Rabaul, the 4th Air Division, they're at Rabaul, but you've got all these units that those people control. So what they're doing is they're looking at pushing all these Japanese back to Medang and then cutting them off when they drive into Sidor. The thing is, though, is Clarence Martin doesn't go far enough and it allows the Japanese to keep pushing west. When the Japanese push out to go west, they leave this town called Sayo, and that's where the Japanese 20th Division was. The Australians come in there. They've got minesweepers. They find what they think is a giant mine. It's a trunk. It has every Japanese code book in it um, from the 20th Division. The guys who were supposed to destroy it, they thought, we'll bury it next to this river. The water will get in, destroy it, but it gets captured. That immediately goes to MacArthur's headquarters uh, with the Central Bureau, which is his code-breaking unit. They had spent two years trying to break into Japanese codes. All of a sudden, overnight, they become a high-class, ultra-producing organization. And you go from maybe a few hundred messages a month to now thousands a day. And so within weeks, they have a clear picture of where the Japanese are completely across New Guinea. And they realize that that next spot that they want to look at that Hansa Bay Wewak has 40,000 Japanese troops there. But just beyond that is a place called Hollandia. And there, it's a major airfield complex, but there's no troops there. But that's a 580-mile leap that they would have to make to get there. Now, MacArthur's looking at this, but he also has a guy in his uh, operations division called Bonner Fellers. He's known him since the West Point days in the early 20s. And Fellers said, comes to him and says, like, you know, he doesn't know about Ultra, but he's like, it, you know, we, we should just bypass all these troops and go into Hollandia. The thing is, though, is if you want to take Hollandia, you have to take the Admiralties because they're going to be in your back door. It's got Mamote airstrip there on, on Los Negros Island. It's about a 5,000 foot strip. And the Japanese are using that as a position point to ferry things into Rabaul. Now, come into February time frame, it looks like Rabaul is kind of weakening because they're, the Navy's hitting Truck Island where the main Japanese bases are. Um, but this Admiralty Island's position is one that if they want to do this Hollandia jump, they have to take that. And so that's why the Admiralty's becomes this main concern that it does. You always do such a good job, Jim, of laying out what, why these things are happening. I wish we well, could I have my hands to work with. <laughs> we need a map so that we can kind of <laughs> yeah. see this because I think that would help sometimes too. But so you've mentioned the the code breaking and we know that MacArthur has very good code breaking and this great intelligence at this time. In late February, there's that report um, that based on aerial reconnaissance that Los Negros, the largest of the islands, appears to have been evacuated by the Japanese. So we know MacArthur has that great intelligence. Does he know that there are 4,000 Japanese still in the islands? Or does he believe the report that it looks like they're all gone and Los Negros is kind of an easy target? No, I, he knows that there are that many people there. Um, the the thing is with this is that in December of 1943, right when they were getting ready to go into New Britain with the 1st Marine Division at Cape Gloucester, George Marshall shows up in the Southwest Pacific area, chief of staff of the U.S. Army. He's the only time he's going to come out to the Pacific. He had just been at Tehran for that big combined chiefs conference where Stalin shows up, Roosevelt's there, Churchill's there. And they had really come to the conclusion that the Navy is going to look at this Central Pacific drive going all the way across the Pacific towards Formosa and absorbing all of MacArthur's material. So MacArthur said that when Mar Marshall comes to visit him, he tells him, you know, you can plan for the Philippines, but it's probably not going to happen. Uh, the, the Navy is very much dead set on this. The, the British chiefs are behind this. And he also tells him, Admiral King is totally against you. He has this childish hatred of you. The Navy back there acts infantile. Those aren't my words. Those are the words that, you know, Henry Stimson said that Marshall says to him, Secretary of War Stimson. And so MacArthur is looking at being sidelined. And so he's looking for an opportunity, you know, to, to advance the timetable. Because, see, Nimitz has just moved a thousand miles forward to the Gilberts, taking Tarawa, November 43. He's going to move 2,000 miles forward in February of 44 when he goes into the Marshall Islands. Now, MacArthur believes that that New Guinea-Philippines axis is the way to go to Tokyo. He believes that you can lose less men that way. It's the more feasible way to go. 
but he's not proving it. And so when it gets to that point of looking at the admiralties, he knows this can flip the script on everything. And he knows that there are 4,000 troops there. But it's like Ed Dre said about MacArthur. He is a man that has clear strategic vision. He accepts the calculated risk. And he's just nothing but audacity. And so he measures those things out. And it goes to show that even though signal intelligence is proving it's, you know, exactly right about things, it's just another tool to him. You know, he trusts his own experience more than anything. And so he knows that there are that many people there. But Kenny comes to him on the 22nd and says, look, my pilots say they're getting no cook fires. They're getting no laundry. They're not seeing anybody there. Let's move in there right now. And MacArthur says to Kinney, if Kincaid, Admiral Thomas Kincaid, who runs his 7th Fleet, if he's okay with this, then I'm for this. And Kincaid says, yeah, we can do this. And so then it's on. Now, they had just decided, I think, in about February 20th, that they weren't going to go into the Admiralties until April with the full 1st Cavalry Division. And then all of a sudden, the next day, they say, nope, we're going in in four days with a 1,000 troopers of the 2nd Squadron, 5th Cavalry, and Ken Kruger, who's head of the 6th Army, just goes ballistic, you know, because, you know, this is just ridiculous. Why are we doing this? And uh, because he believes what Willoughby's telling that G2, that this place is full of, uh, but Kruger doesn't know about Ultra either yet. Meanwhile, Barbie, who runs the amphibious group, he's livid because he has no amphibious ships ready to go for this. They're going to have to put everybody on a destroyer you know, to take them up there. And this first big amphibious operation, you know, in the Admiralty is going to be all from destroyers. And so everybody's really kind of, you know, against this, except for Kenny Kincaid and MacArthur. And MacArthur makes the decision, you know, this, this, this is going to happen. So it's Kenny that is behind the idea to land early. And yeah, he agrees. And then they do it. And we, there's that story that MacArthur, when he's kind of making the decision to go with this idea that he says, well, you know, that'll put a cork in the bottle in relation to Rabal. Right. Because it, it once you once you take that, you've taken away that stopping point for sh- putting in planes into Rabal. Halsey has now made his loop. You know, they've totally isolated. Plus the Japanese pulling out of Truck Island, uh, that kind of isolated Rabal as well. But MacArthur feels that, you know, if you can take this position, then Rabal's just over with, you know, and, and that's when he finally gets the whole bypassing, you know, bug, you know, from that when they're, when they're going to do this. But they, they, they look at it as something, if they can seize it, this will, you know, just accelerate the timetable, uh, keep them on the map as far as the JCS is concerned, and as well uh, to take care of this position that will hamper any uh, further drives up New Guinea. So to them, it's everything. So the invasion begins on February 29th, 1944. And Admiral Kincaid says that MacArthur watched the pre-invasion bombardment of Los Negros from the deck of the Phoenix, and that the experience converted MacArthur to the idea that naval firepower was a very important tool. Do you agree with that? Yeah, and Kincaid later said that it was probably a bad thing because then MacArthur could never understand why naval gunfire couldn't do everything that he wanted. You <laughs> know, but the the wild thing is like the 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 night before they go in on the 29th, I think uh, the 27th, uh, Kruger had started this group called the Alamo Scouts. And they were like a, a special like rangers, commandos, and th- that he sends into beaches before they go in. And he sent a team under this Lieutenant J.C. McGowan by Catalina Flying Boat. Then they rowed ashore and then they got picked up uh, the next day. And they come out saying, you know, that whole island is lousy with Japanese. There's just, you know, tons of Japanese everywhere. And Kruger puts... McGowan on the boat with William C. Chase, who's the Brigadier General, who's going to command that reconnaissance and force that goes in. And he goes in and tells Chase, you know, so that Chase has no illusions about this. You got you got a whole island full of Japanese there waiting for you, you know, when you get in there. So the 29th, they, they roll in there. And the thing is, is that MacArthur all of a sudden says, I'm going with it. 
you know, I'm, I'm, I'm going on this thing, which he had never allowed Kruger to do before because he didn't want Kruger to get put into this position. But MacArthur says, I have to be there in case I, you know, have to pull out the troops or bring in the reinforcements. You know, I'm going to be there to make the decision. And so then uh, Kincaid adds a couple of light cruisers to the bombardment force. He's got this guy, Russell Berkeley. He's going to run about six destroyers and these two light cruisers that will run the bombardment. William Fechteller is the amphibious guy. He'll be dropping um, all the troopers from the three APD destroyers, which can hold about 170 troopers apiece, then about 57 troopers on each destroyer. They've got only 12 landing boats that they're going to land all these people from. But the key thing was that Admiral Kincaid, Everybody said, let's go into Seedler Harbor, which is the biggest harbor in the Pacific. That's why they want the Admiralty Islands. But Kincaid says, no, let's go around and go on the smaller island, Los Negros, and go in this place called Hyane Harbor. The Japanese are totally on the other beach, on Yoshio Izaki in his 51st and the 229th. They're looking into Seedler Harbor. So they get caught in the wrong position when they land at Hyane Harbor because there's water between Manus and Los Negros Island. So they can't get over there real quick. And so that's how you get a thousand troopers ashore uh, with the battery B of the 99th field artillery. And then uh, you've got MacArthur lands at about four o'clock and he's walking around on the beach and every, you know, trooper has heard nothing but dug out Doug. And, you know, that dispels that completely. They think he's the king, you know, because he's out there, you know, right on the airfield. I mean, Doc Engelberg, who's MacArthur's aide, said he could hear Japanese talking right across the field while MacArthur's out there walking on the on the Mamote airstrip. He gets a hold of Chase, who's there. He says, you got your teeth in him. Keep a hold of him. I'm going to send in reinforcements. And uh, then Fechteller takes off. And and that landing group takes off. And then you've got a few destroyers that are left there that night. Uh, Baba, who runs the 229th Japanese Infantry, they try a counterattack that night. Basically, the word was stay in your foxhole and shoot anything that's moving around on top of you. Those destroyers sit there and pound all the Japanese making moves and they hold them off for that night. The next morning when they woke up, or not when they woke up, but when the sun came up, Captain Baba, who runs at 229th, he was about 30 yards from Chase's headquarters. And he and this group of people get wiped out, you know, right that morning. I mean, it was just crazy. A couple of days later, they bring in the rest of the 5th Cavalry. They bring in the 40th Seabees, and the Seabees start making trenches. And then on the 3rd and 4th, I mean, that the counterattack comes in, and, and that's when all hell just goes, breaks loose, and, and this is the big battle. But uh, after that, they'll lay in the 7th Cavalry, the 12th Cavalry, the 8th Cavalry, and, you know, get the full 1st Cavalry division. And it'll take till May to, to squelch this, but, you know, they once they get through that that first five days of being able to hold off those counterattacks till they can get in those reinforcements, I mean, that was it. And that that's why, you know, it, it really does come down to, you know, those troopers and those CBs. And it's funny because that movie, The Fighting Seabees, came out like two days or three days before they lay in there in the in the, the Admiralty. So they had to totally live up to that to that moniker. But they they saved MacArthur's drive across the Philippines as you know, to the Philippines as far as I'm concerned. So I've got a question then that mostly relates to terminology. When you read about this, they don't always call it an invasion. They call it a reconnaissance in force. Can you explain that to us? Well, that was the the thousand men, you know, because they were going to go in with the whole division, which has like 13,000, you know, people. And they were going to go in, you know, like immediately okay. into that big giant Seedler Harbor. They would have, you know, landed everybody in there. But when they throw these thousand men in there, that's what that's what I mean about MacArthur being on on the spot to say, OK, we're going to bring in the rest of the division or let's get them out, you know, because this is too hairy for him to to be in there. So that's what it really comes into, you know, putting that that first contingent of that second squadron, fifth cavalry in there. Okay. So that just refers to like the first part of it. Yeah. Yeah. They bring in the other. Okay. Yeah. All right. And and you've mentioned MacArthur and obviously he was very present there. A lot of people remember him there. Lots of stories. It makes sense that he wants to be there to kind of make quick decisions on the ground about what's happening. But are there any other reasons? Do you think that it, I mean, we know that he was very wounded by the the moniker dugout Doug. Yeah. Do you yeah. think he's also driven by this sense that I just really need to excise? Like I, I need people to know that I'm not dugout Doug. 
Well, there's a, you know, the, the guy's 64 now. You know, he's 64 years old. I mean, every, every, Person in the Rainbow Division in World War One said beyond question he was the bravest person anybody had ever seen in their entire life. You know, when they were putting out the Medal of Honor and they said, who in the Rainbow needs it? They said, you know, I can get every single person to sign on that MacArthur's the guy that deserves it. So here at 64, you know, he's told Rogers, who's the secretary of, of the headquarters, that, you know, he feels like he's too old. You know, the, he feels like his legs are toothpicks. He doesn't want to go and... and uh fail in front of the men. Then again, there's also a month before that in January, the American Mercury had come out with this article where the the author basically said that MacArthur had not been at the front the whole war. And so, you know, does MacArthur feel like, you know, he has to do this to prove, you know, to them as well as himself, you know, that he's got to do this? I mean, there's a lot that goes into it. I think the main thing, though, is that he finds he can do it. And it is invigorating to him, and he'll do it from then on. You know, Hollandia, Mortai, Leyte, Luzon, Borneo. He's there, you know, first first day, you know, within hours of, of everybody landing. And I, I think I think he, he finds it as, you know, I look at it in the in the sense that the that World War One commander is back, you know, that that he finally becomes that that guy of, of 1918 again. And I mean, what other theater commander is doing that? None of them do that. You know, nobody says, oh, you're a coward, you know, sitting behind the lines. It's just it's MacArthur because of who he was in the first war, you know, and people kind of looking at that. So, I mean, there's a lot of elements that go into it, but I think a lot of it has to do with that. You know, I, I have to make that decision, you know, of whether this is going to happen or not. And in defense of some of those other theater commanders, I'm sure they're not supposed to be doing that. No, you know, yeah, you know. (laughs) All right. So by the end of the operation on May 18th, 1944, you have 326 killed, over a thousand wounded, and four missing. Some commanders thought that if the operation had not been accelerated, that the losses would have been less and that the length of the operation would have been shorter. Do you think that's true? Do you think that he should have waited? Did he get lucky or was it the right call? Well, I mean, luck, you know, as, as definitely it plays into it. I mean, I, the the main thing is, is uh, I think, Kincaid, you know, picking Hyane Harbor over Seedler Harbor. If they had gone in in April, they would have had Nimitz's carriers supporting them for that first time. I think every everybody is always about advancing the timetable you know, getting it over with as quick as possible, as well as if you wait for another month, how well would their defenses have improved over that time? You know, would they have brought in more troops? Who knows? Would they have decided to not defend on the beaches and make some bastion in, in back of the island like they do on Biak? So it's it's a hard, hard way to tell. I mean, it definitely, you know, advances the timetable in MacArthur's theater. It definitely proves to be the key element in getting the JCS to back his his future moves. So, I mean, in the sense of, of MacArthur in Southwest Pacific area, he would say it was everything. Ben, you don't know, you know, what would have happened later. All right. Final thoughts. And I think you've already touched on all of this, but does it put the cork in the bottle? And then can you explain his next steps after this? What does this tee him up for in terms of going back to the Philippines? Yeah, it, it definitely ends Rabao as being um, anything to worry about in the future. Um, I think that uh, it definitely also is what persuades the JCS. I mean, days after MacArthur makes, after the First Cavalry makes that landing, uh, his chief of staff Sutherland is at the Pacific War Conference in Hawaii. And they, he goes in there and says, we just took the Admiralties. Here's our next operational plan, Reno 4, which takes us to the next jump, Hollandia, 580 miles, and then uh, all the way into the Southern Philippines. And the JCS are like, yeah. March 12th, they agree to to all of it, you know. Now, were they going to shut him down? Who knows? I, I mean, I, MacArthur and those guys definitely look at it that way. But I think it, you know, it it definitely, without seizing the admiralties, would have they gotten the approval to go to Hollandia when they do? Um, no, they probably had a wait, would have waited a lot, a lot longer um, before they were able to move in there. So I think in that sense, it's everything. The, the thing, though, it, it causes the biggest explosion between Halsey and MacArthur. It's because on the 28th, the day the day before they go in, Marshall actually says to MacArthur, okay, well, this is going to become a major naval base. 
you know, for the Central Pacific. And it does. It becomes the major rework uh, dry dock facility for the Pacific Fleet in the Western Pacific, you know, outside of Pearl. And so you don't have to go back to Pearl Harbor all the time. And the Navy's idea, you know, thinking was the CBs are already there. Let's just start building the base there and we'll just take it over. And MacArthur goes, livid. You know, I just took this island and now you're going to take it, uh, you know, away from me and give it to the Navy. And he says, I'm kicking out all the Central Pacific <laughs> Forces from Seymour Harbor and Halsey's like you're gonna you're gonna you know lengthen the war effort you're hampering the war effort and he said everybody in MacArthur's headquarters was like we've never heard anybody talk to him like that before and Halsey said for three days MacArthur would kept badgering him like no this is the way we should do it and Halsey was like nope it's not gonna happen and finally you know MacArthur was like okay you win Bill and it just shows that if MacArthur could badger you enough to make you change your mind then you know, that's what it was all about. But he he realized that Halsey and the Navy wasn't going to budge. And he was like, OK, but I just love that. You're going to you're hampering the war. Effort. And I was just thinking that um, from the time that this operation ends on Los Negros or I guess in the Admiralties, they're five months away from the Philippines from landing. Yeah. I wow. mean, you, five, and, five. And when you think about all the planning and what has to happen between this point and then yeah. i mean that's that's a lot i mean it's and incredible. you've got like yeah. you've in in may of 1944 kruger has like five operations going on he's got the admiralties he's got itape they got they just landed on biak he's got this massive problem on the New Guinea coast right near Walk the Island. How he keeps it all straight is just, you know, beyond me. But that's MacArthur. Speed, speed, speed. Got to keep him off balance and, and you know, keep moving. And you're right. I mean, a few short months later, they're in the Philippines. Yeah, it's just incredible. And maybe that's another reason why Marshall's very content to let <laughs> MacArthur have more kind of control over, you know, what the direction of the war is, what's happening next. Maybe Maybe yeah. Washington can't well, micromanage you, that. You think about it, in the European theater, the War Department's War Plans Division makes all the plans. Right. In the Pacific, in the Southwest Pacific, MacArthur makes all the plans. Nobody's telling him, you know, this is where you go at all. He, you know, they make up all of it. So it's a, you know, it's a, it's a different jam. All right, Jim. Well, thank you so much for joining us and sharing all of your expertise. Thank you for listening. If you have questions, suggestions, or comments, we want to hear from you. You can find us on Twitter at MacArthur1880, on Facebook as the General Douglas MacArthur Memorial, or you can email MacArthurMemorial at Norfolk.gov.